Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to the Atlantic Council. I'm Andrea Montanino. I'm the director of the Global Business and Economics Program. Special welcome to Robert Cardillo, the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence, Intelligence Agency, NGA, who is joining us today for our fourth event in the Power of Transparency uh, series, co-hosted with uh, our partner, Thomson Reuters. You see in the banner the two organizations uh, organizing the, this event. A warm welcome, of course, to our uh, Thomson Reuters friends, the team, a special thank to Kate Frederick for her relentless efforts of making this series a success. But where's Kate? It's always too far, you should be there. <laughs> so I look forward to hearing from you, Director Cardillo, how the NGA embraces transparency and the broadening market space as key aspects and assets to advance the state of US intelligence. Uh, the event is on the record, uh, so you can take part of the Q&A uh, actively. You can also follow via Twitter. You can tweet using the hashtag Power of Transparency. Uh, before I hand over the floor, I'm delighted to announce the next two uh, uh, events in our Power of Transparency series for uh, January 25th and February 8th. This will, be, uh, this will be the last two events of the series. On January 25th, Richard Berner, director of the Office of Financial Research, we talk about the power of transparency in preventing future financial crisis. And on February the 8th, uh, Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF, of the International Monetary Fund, will close the series talking about how the International Monetary Fund is enhancing uh, transparency around the world and increasing economic growth. Uh, with that being said, I would like to hand over to Mr. Stephen Rebley, the Managing Director of the Government Segment of Thomson Reuters. In his capacity, Mr. Rebley has profits and loss responsibility for the entire portfolio of business into the federal, state and local government arena and is responsible for the strategic direction and execution of new growth initiative. Um, Without further ado, please, Mr. Rubley, the floor is yours. Thank you, Andrea. And welcome, everybody. I, I appreciate everybody coming out today. And it's an honor to be here at the Atlantic Council for what Andrea mentioned as our fourth event in the Power of Transparency series. And we're, we're, we're happy to be joined today by the director of the National Intelligence Geospatial Agency, Robert Cardillo, in what we believe will be a great discussion today. Uh, the NGA is the nation's primary source of geospatial intelligence for the Department of Defense and the U.S. intelligence community. In this important role, NGA delivers world-class geospatial intelligence that provides a decisive advantage to policymakers war fighters and intelligence professionals and first responders. Well, at Thomson Reuters, we uh, also deeply care about ensuring that our intelligence community has all the resources and tools necessary to provide to our nation and the global community more broadly. Today, to fight against corruption, illicit activity, and terrorism is truly a team effort, requiring resources from both the government and the private sector. Thomson Reuters today partners with the intelligence community, law enforcement, private sector companies to increase transparency, identify threats, mitigate risk, as well as expose corruption, fraud, and illicit activity, all of which protects our nation and protects the public. Government agencies and companies today look to us to provide the intelligence and tools they need to make informed decisions. Our approach to these critical issues using using predictive analytics, open source information, technology, and human expertise is valued to provide trusted answers. As we delve into topics, including today, such as private-public partnerships, global information sharing, transparency, and the value of open source and proprietary information, to the intelligence community, Thomson Reuters is proud to be on the ground floor of this discussion. Our discussion today will be uh, uh, we'll touch on many of these issues, and I'd like to acknowledge our moderator, Mr. John Walcott, Foreign Affairs and National Security Editor at Reuters News. John is an accomplished veteran of international relations journalism. From 2011 to 2015, he was team leader for national security and foreign affairs at Bloomberg, 
Prior to that, he was Washington bureau chief for McClatchy and for Knight Ritter. Previously, he was foreign editor and national editor of the U.S. News and World Report, national security correspondent at the Wall Street Journal, and chief diplomatic correspondent at Newsweek. In 2008, John was the inaugural winner of the I.F. Stone Medal for Journalistic Independence from the Neiman Foundation at Harvard. He has also won diplomatic reporting awards from Georgetown University and the National Pre Press Club. So before we get started, I'd like to introduce our distinguished guest, Mr. Cardillo. Robert Cardillo is the sixth, sixth director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency and was appointed to that position in October 2014. He actually began his career as an imagery analyst, so he has an opportunity to uh, return to his roots, which is nice. He leads and directs NGA under the authorities of the Secretary of Defense and the Director of National Intelligence. Prior to this assignment, Director Cardillo served as the first Deputy for Intelligence Integration, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, from 2010 to 2014. In addition, he served as Deputy Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, DIA, and the Deputy Director for Analysis at DIA from 2006 to 2010. In the summer of 2009, he served as Acting J-2, a first for a civilian, in support of the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Before he moved to DIA, Director Cardillo led analysis and production, as well as source operations and management at NGA from 2002 to 2006. His leadership assignments at NGA also included Congressional Affairs, Public Affairs, and Corporate Relations. He began his career with DIA in 1983, as I said, as an imagery analyst. He was selected to the Senior Executive Service in 2000. Throughout his career, Director Cardillo has been known as an innovator, one who has encouraged the intelligence community to take risks, embrace technology, improve integration of effort, and partner with industry. Not surprisingly, he has received many prestigious awards. During the 30 plus years in the intelligence community, he is re the recipient of the Director of National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, the Presidential Rank of Distinguished Executive, the Presidential Rank of Meritorious Executive, and the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Meritorious Civilian Service Award, just to name a few. Refle reflecting on the pace of change, Director Cordillo has made it clear to his own workforce, what got us here won't get us there. That's an axiom that no doubt applies to many of us. I've personally been in intrigued by Dr. Cadillo's approach, which I think is applicable to the private sector as well. For him, it's about the C construct, uh, the four Cs. Uh, in, in marketing, you hear about the four Ps, but the, the C construct, creating content, placing content into context, conveying that information to the customer in such a way to achieve desired consequence. I think we're all about achieving desired consequence. The question, though, is how to get there, which, uh, by the way, I've used some of those, those four Cs, so appreciate that. I know we're all eager to hear from him today, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Director Cardillo. So this is the portion of the program in which the speaker says he's happy to be here. But Seriously, this is my happy face. I know I've got to tell my workforce all the time, but uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I look forward, uh, more importantly, to the conversation we'll have over here. But let me set the stage, provide a little context so that we can have a richer conversation when we move to the chair. John, I look forward to joining you uh, in that role. Uh, we are on the record. I need to already correct the record. There's no doctor, okay? There's no PhD, so anybody, don't, don't tweet that out, uh, please, that I'm falsely claiming some sort of PhD hood here. Um, okay, uh, seriously, happy to be here. Look forward to the conversation, um, but uh, as I said, let me set the stage um, uh, that has been admirably established by both the Atlantic Council and Thomson Reuters. Uh, the agency that I'm privileged to lead uh, just turned 20. Uh, 20, even in this town, is, is pretty young. Uh, the profession that we're privileged to be responsible for is much older. And let me show you just one example, and that'll be the first slide. It's a rather famous graphic in, in our realm, uh, which uh, in a very pretty succinct way 
describes a momentous series of events, that is Napoleon's campaign against Russia in 1812 to 1813. And if you haven't seen it before, basically the thickness of the line uh, describes the size of the Napoleonic force that he started with. So that's the beige, the light beige there on the far left. And then the reduction of that force over time. And in the far upper right is Moscow. Um, and you see that's where the campaign ended. Uh, and then he began his return back to France. And of course, you can see the line thinning out. So there's space and there's time. And oh, by the way, uh, across the bottom, there's even temperature because it mattered. Uh, it mattered greatly to his ability to feed that force uh, and to keep that force alive. Now, I love the graphic because it tells a story, a very important story, uh, through the confluence of, of disparate data sources, but in a way that kind of meaningly conveys you know, the, the, the effect. Right, the consequence here. Um, what I didn't tell you, though, is when the graphic was actually created, 1869. So a little bit of a time gap right, between the event and the ability or the interest or the demand signal to put it all together. So um, even though this is now 200 plus years old, the event itself, I use it to tell my workforce, to remind my workforce that uh, data on your desk or on your computer or in your head is interesting, is interesting, but not very useful unless you can find a way that gets it to the, to the customer in a way that they can use it. That's true on the most classified of intelligence operations because that special forces operator or that operative or that policymaker or that warfighter cannot use the information either. It's just as true when we're in an environment such as this. And so what I want to talk about is how we're striving to be more uh, effective and relevant uh, in the open uh, in a way that's meaningful uh, to those that we serve both inside and outside the government. Now let me fast forward almost a couple hundred years uh, to the next graphic. And this is 1995. And you'll see some of the effects of the worst atrocities in Europe since World War II. Now, this was the former Yugoslavia um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and the region in which was engulfed in violence uh, for a number of years in the 90s. Well, in 95, the US with the international community put together an effort that eventually were called the Dayton Accords. Those accords were designed to create a conversation that you see a bit of, on the right of this graphic to create an understanding about how one might move from the violent conflict to some sort of territorial negotiation, ultimate resolution about lines and cultures, et cetera. Uh, uh, the predecessor, because NGA did not exist in 1995, one of our predecessors was the Defense Mapping Agency. The Defense Mapping Agency came in and helped fill in the gap between that devastation and those negotiation. And the next graphic you'll see is one of the maps that was used at the time to delineate the boundaries to reflect that social compact and international agreement that at least it, uh, resolved um, the large magnitude of violence that the region was uh, experiencing. And I use that as a pivot point because within a, within a year, uh, Congress established the National Imagery and Mapping Agency, and you are now going to get more than confused with the names and the, and the acronyms, and I apologize. Uh, uh, but when we were established by Congress, that was our first name, Imagery and Mapping Agency. Uh, we changed in 2004 to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency to reflect what I'm about to talk about, that it isn't just about a picture and a map. What's really important is how can you combine the information and create coherence across disparate sources of information, and sometimes, in some cases, conflicting sources of information in a way that provides coherence and conveys a, an ability for somebody to either think through a problem set differently or understand a threat or an opportunity in a way that helps them make better decisions. And so that's what I'd like to talk to you about now is this world of geospatial uh, uh, intelligence. Uh, 
Now we use unclassified imagery, we use geospatial products to support a variety of efforts of which I'll, some of which I'll describe here, whether they're humanitarian assistance, disaster recovery, land reclamation, historic preservation, and security for special events such as the Olympics, even the Super Bowl, and yes, right now we're preparing for the inauguration uh, a week from now. Um, uh, I should remind, and by the way, we can talk about more of this when I'm sitting over here. When I apply, my assets, government assets, sorry, didn't mean to personalize that. Uh, in the US, I have to do it under very strict legal guidelines. I've got my lawyer right here, thank you. <laughs> but that, on a more serious note, I don't have any authority to use the tools, the assets of my agency domestically unless I have a domestic use. And that can only come from somebody who has domestic authority. So in this case, the Department of Homeland Security, who's responsible broadly for the security uh, around events that will occur this weekend next, task me with their authorities, in which case I then go through proper use memorandum and legal review uh, to apply my assets in that way. But again, if that doesn't satisfy you as to where the bounds are between what we can and can't do, uh, I'll be over there in just a few minutes and we, you can pick up that conversation. Another example of where we apply our capabilities in uh, public ways uh, is the Arctic. And the next graphic will show you an example of something that, oh no it won't, oh, Cardillo went out of order. Uh, <laughs> What, uh, what all I want to tell you here is that if you look at the left side of the chart, uh, that's all I would have shown, well, I wouldn't even have shown you this in 1983 because I would have never left my building, right? I would have never left my vault. I would have never, I would have looked at all of you and I said, you don't have badges on. If you don't have badges, I can't speak with you and et cetera, et cetera. But suffice to say on the left side is where the Intel community exists and has existed. And we've always served the military, we've always served the government, we've always had in industry partners, but more and more we're getting better at uh, creating new connections, uh, new interdependencies on the right side of the chart. And whether that's our international partners, um, a growing consortium of uh, academic uh, and, and think tanks, uh, and more and more the public, in, in which case I'll uh, provide you some examples here soon one of which you already know is going to be the Arctic. Okay, next. Oh, here it is. So, uh, this you can find on our homepage, um, and uh, a little difficult to see here, but basically we're tracking uh, the reality of the reduction of ice uh, in the polar region. Um, I will not uh, address questions as to why uh, that ice is melting. It's not my job. My job is to understand the effects of the facts that the ice is melting. So in one case, right, less ice means more maritime accessibility, sea lanes. Uh, some of those sea lanes are for economic use, obviously. You can reduce costs by moving uh, goods through that northwest passage for a longer period of time. The other thing the sea ice does is that it exposes natural resources that were prohibitively expensive to get after before. As those become exposed, it creates the opportunity for competition. Competition could create tension, tension could create conflict. Now you're getting closer to my job, right? So we do monitor uh, the fact of the reduction of ice. But that's, that's what you're seeing here. My bigger responsibility is, is the implication or consequence of that reduction in ice coverage. Um, another example, though, that we did at the, at the White House's request as the U.S. took the chair of what's called the Arctic Council, um, uh, the last cycle of the Council's chair, was to provide more uh, baseline data. We call it foundation data for scientific purposes. Again, I'm not the guy that explains the science behind why, you know, what's happening in the Arctic. But what we were able to do was to use our assets okay, uh, government assets in a way that gave the scientists better models to, to, to apply their algorithms or their theories or their, um, their equations. And so we did, and many of these are called dig digital elevation matrices. Just think of elevation maps, right, the heights of the earth at different points around the globe. 
Um, we were able to do Alaska again with a duly uh, federal authority tasking me to do so. And uh, the Arctic in a way uh, that had never been done before, down to two meter spacing. Now what that means is that every two meters on the ground, we were able to provide an elevation point. Uh, that may not sound like a lot to you, but trust me, what they had before was vastly uh, less resolution. So when I met the scientists who were using our new models that we're providing, oh, by the way, on the World Wide Web, okay, so this isn't, you know, some scientists get them, some don't, we were providing it all, is I found out the implication for them was they could reduce their error bounds. So whether they were studying the hydrography or the melt runoff or the, you know, the change over time, Heretofore, they had an error bound that, that was this because of the spacing they had and they were able to do this. Again, again, we just provided a better base uh, for their understanding. Uh, the next example you'll see uh, takes us to West Africa and now um, uh, over two years ago. And this was the crisis around the Ebola epidemic uh, and, and at its uh, centerpiece in West Africa, specifically Liberia. When the president declared that a national security issue, okay, that allowed me, oh, and he also tasked the 101st uh, Airborne Division to deploy in support of the medical technicians that needed to provide the relief uh, to those that were suffering most, NGA went with them. And we went with them physically, so my officers are embedded and went to support the deployment. But more importantly now, our job was to reduce time in two ways. You wanted to reduce time between the symptom and the diagnosis, and then between the diagnosis and the treatment. The way you did that in a country with, let's call it challenging infrastructure, right? Not the kinds of roads and rail uh, networks that we might be familiar with. It was critical that those doctors and those technicians put the clinics and the treatment units in the best places to treat the most people to reduce those two time periods. And the reduction of those time periods saved lives. I didn't just say NGA saved lives. We enabled those who did the life saving to be in the right place at the right time. I like to, and by the way, uh, those doctors have no clearances. They have no interest or ability to sign on to a classified computer. So again, World Wide Web, accessible to them without username or password, or it's not relevant. I won't tell you it was easy. It was quite hard for us to do it. By the way, my, my lawyers had long talks with me. My policy officers had long talks with me. My, um, uh, my contracts officers had long talks with me. And so uh, we learned a lot through that application, but, and we're much better at it. Six months after that event, uh, Nepal experienced a terrible earthquake. We were, we, what we had learned in our Ebola experience transferred over, we were able to move to the web uh, much more quickly. Um, so again, um, uh, something that we're getting better at uh, to show um, relevance uh, in a time frame and in a way that meets the needs that those are deployed. Um, all of this is inconsistent with the, the theme of the theories here, which is transparency. Um, yes, I, I, I have a mission to, as part of the U.S. intelligence community, and yes, transparency isn't always what you think of when you're talking to an intelligence officer, and yes, I am charged with protecting U.S. sources and methods. We've had a lot of discussion about this of late. Um, that is my responsibility, and I believe that there's both an opportunity and an obligation for agencies such as mine to engage with you, but also with industry and with countries and with companies in a different way uh, that I think can be mutually beneficial. Um, one of the things we're looking at, because, uh, and I should have said this earlier, well, I, I talked about my industrial partners. We have great relationship uh, and, and interdependent relationships with, with US companies that provide us services and support. I do think that there, there can be a new paradigm uh, that we could discuss more over here about a public-private partnership. Um, in that partnership, I can imagine in which I could find a way to expose data, historic and otherwise, 
that could inform additional scientific understanding of planetary changes, ecological, environmental, et cetera. But also historic research that might inform a new series of deep learning, automated intelligence, perhaps eventually artificial intelligence. By the way, don't ask me a lot of questions about that. That's not me. Remember, no PhD. But that said, but I do know that there's a, there's, there's a, there's a, tr there's a real value in that historic data to enable the learning that's required to get us to that automation and perhaps artificial intelligence. If that's true, if that's true, we want to be part of that conversation. And again, I would have my lawyer with me uh, every step of the way. Um, let me show uh, one more graphic here uh, before I uh, finish with a video and get off the stage or move to that part of the stage. Um, and this is a, a phrase I use often, is that, you know, look, we're, we're proud of our success in the past. Remember that closed environment, exclusive access uh, when we stayed behind our green door and whatnot. Um, I think we did do a service for the nation. It wasn't one that you heard much about, but that was the deal. You weren't supposed to hear much about it. I would offer that we've got to find a way how we can protect that as necessary because we'll still need to do things out of the public view for our customers. But we do have to find a way to succeed in the open. And we can't do that alone. Uh, we need to do it with you. Part of the reason that I'm here today is to engage in a conversation about what that might mean, what are the left and right bounds, what are the implications of, et cetera. And I'm sure I'll learn more here as we have our conversation. But let me finish uh, uh, with this. And I don't know if we figured out that this, oh, it is going to work. So this is video. What you're watching is the deployment of two imaging satellites uh, from a company called Planet. Uh, they're based out of California. Um, the satellite size uh, that you're seeing there is, is about that big. So a loaf of bread. The reason you're hearing Russian speaking is because they're being launched from the International Space Station. And they're being launched from the Russian segment of that station. Um, there's many things that I like to talk about this video. One, first, I, by the way, th you, you can stop that now. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one, heretofore, for me to get an imaging asset into space, uh, you've seen them, right? Big stacks of rockets, multiple stages, huge plumes going out left and right, you know. Uh, and you can imagine the expense involved, right? The necessary expense in lifting such a capability into space. Um, the launch mechanism for that, that you just saw there, is a spring, right? About this big and a little lever releases and pushes it out into space. Now, yes, it had to get there somehow. That involved a rocket. So I'm not trying to skip over some of the hard parts here. <laughs> this is very complicated stuff. And oh, by the way, uh, I could have brought examples in which uh, they were not successful in getting those doves, they call the vehicles doves, to space because space is hard. And there's a lot of kinetic energy that's involved in lifting uh, something off our planet into space. And so accidents occur, et cetera. Um, oh, and by the way, too, I should say I don't show you this because I'm trying to market a particular company. This is one example of many companies that are now involved uh, in this business. Uh, this particular company, though, has the objective within a reasonably short period of time to use those kinds of vehicles to image the planet every day. And at least for a guy in the imagery business, that's worth saying again, to image the planet every day. Now, you can imagine that a, that a sensor this big probably doesn't have the same capabilities that the sensors that the government might launch, et cetera. But when you have the power of sensing the planet every day, you can interpret and you can use that data to understand things like I've discussed. So changes in the Arctic, uh, um, a magnitude of destruction after a hurricane or a natural disaster like an earthquake, um, changes in environment, et cetera. But many questions we don't even know now. and so. Uh, again, what we're excited about is the future that that represents. 
Um, I'm going to close off this segment now. John, I think you're going to come up and help me begin the conversation. Uh, I'll just finish where I started. Thank you all very much. This is, uh, this is a treat for me, and I look forward to the conversation we're about to have. Thank you very much. We're going here, John? You're okay. there. OK. Just a little geolocation. OK. All right. Thank you, Robert. Uh, we've talked a lot, but little about transparency. I kind of want to ask you what the limits of that are, and in particular, as you were talking about going to two meter separation from six or 10, uh, is there a danger that uh, making that kind of imagery possible allows people to kind of reverse engineer what our capabilities are? Yes. <laughs> no, I'll do more. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> If it's okay, I'm going to broaden the question a little bit. Uh, I thought so we were look, trying to reduce I, the I, I spent uh, a good amount of time talking about what I, what I see as the upside of this transparency, right? Uh, where I think we can add value, where we can be uh, useful in ways that we couldn't before if we can properly leverage these capabilities. Um, let's talk about the other side of that, right? So great, the planet's more transparent. Everybody's got more access to imagery. There are people on the planet that don't have the same values or interests. And as a matter of fact, they may have an interest that's quite contrary to our value or interest. The data is available to them as well. So this introduces or, or this speaks to a role that uh, I also play. I call it counter geoin. What that means is, is I don't just have to, it isn't my responsibility just to tell you where you are and how to get from this place to that place safely or what threat might exist around you. I also owe it to tell you what risk that transparency might have to you. You can imagine that there are certain actions that the US government might take, think of the military, right, in which they'd rather not have a picture taken of them, right? Well, OK. One message I give to the US military is that um, you might need to get over that. Okay, you might. Now look, that doesn't mean you can't do anything. It doesn't mean you shouldn't operate you know, smartly. But if the Earth is going to be imaged every day, the Earth is going to be imaged every day. So you need to figure out how you're going to operate in that environment. To your question on, on reverse engineering, um, sure, we think about it all the time. And trust me, I skipped over a whole lot of meetings and debates about what can we do and what can't we do. And we always balance. The way I describe it is, so oftentimes I'll bring a, a classified product to somebody at the State Department. And, and they'll see it and they'll go, oh my goodness, I need to take this to the podium. I need to go to the press conference with this. And I said, well, you can do that because you know, you, you're allowed and whatnot. Just know I won't bring you this picture tomorrow. Because the, the adversary will then make a choice about, oh, well, if you can do that, I'm going to do my work differently. So there's always a trade that we have to make between the use of and the protection of. Yeah. Let me, let me continue in that vein sure. a little bit, because this also goes to the application of your product to the government. And, and talk a little bit about what uh, NGA contributes to our understanding of what's going on, for example, in a place like North Korea, mm -hmm. where there's considerable concern, again, about mm -hmm. some of the statements the leader has made, mm -hmm. our ability to prevent that from spinning out of control. I'm going to go out on a limb. I don't think it's a big limb, and I don't think I'm going out too far. North Korea is the least transparent place on the, on the, on the globe. It just is. It's the, less, it's the least connected. And by the way, if somebody wants to debate, I'm happy to debate. But I'm pretty sure I'm going to be close to right here. So given that, actually North Korea for, for NGA is a much more traditional problem set. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, we chatted earlier about the culture of my workforce and some discomfiture they're going through with briefings like this. Oh, and by the way, I'm streaming to my desktops in my workforce right now. So. <laughs> uh, a load of them as well. Um, 
but back to your question, absolutely. I mean, North Korea is, is, is where we can apply the good old application of geo in, in a way, because it is difficult to see into that country, and I didn't mean that visually, but just every way possible, it's a, it's a very, we call them hard targets, it's a very hard target. So NGA with our sources and methods, in this case now, most of them are not available on the World Wide Web. We, we do detailed analysis, detailed trends, detailed understanding to give as much information as possible to the president, to the secretary, to the general, so that they can at least have some understanding of what's going on. So you can contribute something to the question of warning, which Correct. is so critical in that. Correct. Um, in that four hours ago, I was in a rather detailed discussion with my Korea team about how well we have provided said warning, given his speech, mm -hmm. um, uh, because, look, uh, we need to take all this very seriously, and so we do, yes. Yeah, um, that's probably about as far as we can go with that one. If you want to go further, be my guest, but. <laughs> I'm good. <laughs> now, I'll refrain from asking you about mobile launchers and yeah. IR yeah, and all that You didn't even stuff. bring it up. Yeah. No, I no. just did, but yeah. oh. you didn't take the bait. <laughs> Um, what about places that are more transparent and where we can see movements? Uh, Syria, yes. Iraq, you talked about those on the Hill last right. year. Uh, Ukraine. Yes, so you remember the, the vignette I told you about, running over to state, showing mm -hmm. pictures. Uh, let's face it, sometimes uh, we have classified access to activities of <coughs> adversaries okay, that violate norms at a minimum, potentially treaties, you know, or international obligations or responsibilities. Um, and part, of State, part of the State Department's job is to sustain those norms, if not those treaties and those obligations. And so in Ukraine, um, uh, NGA contributed significantly to the understanding of what happened to the Malaysian airliner. Um, now the Dutch were responsible and are responsible for making the case, you know, broadly uh, via the courts. Um, but, but what I want you to know is that we, we worked as hard as we could and we had every debate we could about how much can we expose versus how much can we contribute to a public, in this case, understanding of what happened. Um, behind that story are many sensitive capabilities and whatnot, and, and we always have to find that right balance. What I talked about up in the Senate in open testimony was our monitoring of the cessation of hostilities mm -hmm. in Syria, which again, the countries come to agreements about the rules of warfare and the application of power and, and refugee status and whatnot. Yes, uh, you the public, um, certainly those that we serve in the government should rely on NGA to be able to use the transparency in a way that enables that conversation happen more openly. Let me go back to the Malaysian airliner for a minute because it, it, it sort of prompts a second question, which is we're now dealing with another country that uh, has taken advantage of the transparency you talk about, the speed with which information can be transmitted. Uh, they put out, by my count, almost 30 versions of what happened to that airliner mm -hmm. in the first 24 hours. Does that change your calculation about how much to put out factual information? Uh, I'll be frank and say at the time it didn't, okay? It, in, in the event, we, um, I do think it, 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 it will influence how we think about not just our transparent role, but the dynamics with which we use that role. Uh, but I, t I will tell you too, you also remind me to, to add another facet to that counter geoint discussion. Mm -hmm. Look, we're all living in a world of what's real and what's not now, right? Um, clearly people's words can be manipulated, right? And clearly pictures can be manipulated. Mm -hmm. Look, when, when we put our case out, 
right, about what happened, ourselves and via the Dutch, one of the responses is, ah, that's been manipulated, right? You, you have altered the pixels, you've mm -hmm. photoshopped, you've done whatever. I, so this is what I call, this is our, our, our um, uh, chain of evidence isn't right because I'm not a, a, a Yeah, your lawyer's over right, there. Right? <laughs> but here's what I mean. I mean, I, I think we need to work harder and more carefully on pedigree of information. Right, so we always have with respect to sourcing. I mean, you do in your business, right? You have to sustain that credibility throughout. Mm -hmm. Well, look, if, if we're gonna become more transparent, we should be ready for you to come back and go, how do I know that's real, right? How do I, and, and, and we'll have to be prepared at least to engage in that, um, the veracity of. And likewise, if someone else puts out something oh, well, I have a counter picture, right, or tells a different story. I think I need to develop some skills to be able to expose the veracity of that as well. Yeah. Well, if it's any comfort to you, we're, we wrestle with exactly the same problem. Okay. Well. Uh, I'm curious, uh, the, the political environment in this country changed fairly dramatically in November. Uh, we have a change of power that's different than any I've ever seen. I've been here 40 years. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, you, you do a morning call with your mm -hmm. workforce. What did you tell them the morning after the election? Um, so uh, th we do this every day. And I didn't really explain, NGA is a global enterprise. We have about half of our workforce here in Fort Belvoir, just south of Washington. About a quarter of it's out in St. Louis, Missouri. That's our defense mapping agency legacy. And the rest of my team is around the globe. Uh, whether that's uh, at a U.S. military command or an international partner, or deployed uh, in Afghanistan and Iraq uh, today. So they're all on the net, and we're doing our morning stand-up. And at the end of that session on the morning after the election, um, as I suspect wherever you sit politically in the spectrum, uh, 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 in this town or elsewhere, it felt momentous, right? And so I, I just acknowledged uh, the elephant in the room, and by the way, I didn't mean that in a political sense. <laughs> but I get it that it just came out that way. I've, I've never heard about the donkey in the room, so yeah, don't right. worry about okay. it. But look, I just acknowledged, I said, hey team, a momentous event has just occurred, right? No matter where you sit in the political spectrum, and, uh, uh, and, and, and as of now, we're a government in transition. We knew we would be a government in transition, right? Now we are. Um, and, and again, this is hours after the election, and I said, too, look, uh, there will be the risk of distraction. There will be perhaps some conflict and maybe even some confusion. Don't be confused about this because this has not changed, and that's our mission. And so uh, that locational service that we require the U.S. Air Force to safely land that plane, that Navy to navigate that ship, uh, we put the smart uh, into the weapon system when it's required. All of that is sustained. And so, again, I get it, right? You're humans, you're citizens. Uh, you'll have uh, that opportunity to be distracted. Take comfort in the fact that your mission hasn't changed. And, and we've thankfully been able to sustain that throughout. Uh, you mentioned the importance of GPS mm -hmm. coordinates. Uh, General Mattis yesterday made some comments about Russian and Chinese advances in anti-satellite weaponry. Mm -hmm. Do you worry about the security or of conflict in, in space now? We have conflict in cyberspace, and it looks as if we may be headed toward kinetic kinds of conflicts in, in space. So worry, yes. Um, uh, you, you were kind enough to do my whole career, so you're, you realize I joined this business in 1983, forever ago. When I joined the business, we not only had exclusive access to space, right? I mean, it was a pretty benign environment, pretty. Mm -hmm. I mean, space has always been hard and whatnot, but we were there and very few other people were, and so you could be very, pretty confident about where my vehicle is, how it's operating, mm -hmm. et cetera. Fast forward, right, 34 years, to your point, not so benign anymore. Um, 
I can't comment on will we or won't we. All I know is it's, it's, it's well, it's more physically congested too, so there's mm -hmm. you know, fun with that. But, but two, um, f a as a provider of information, ultimately, hopefully, insight to my customers, it's a, it's a new area that I need to understand better. So we know we need to grow that skill set. So, you know, we know the land pretty well. We know the sea pretty well. We know the air pretty well. We better get better. So that, that's just talking as an NGA director that, uh, yes, I have to up my game here uh, because of just the fact of the, the less benign. Yeah. Well, the other place where the environment has changed, and I think you know, people may want to know, is, as you talked some about before, the commercial environment mm -hmm. in, in, in which it would appear to you know, a non-expert like me that the commercial world is catching up with. And I can now buy pictures of Syria yep. Yep. that you alone had yep. 20 years ago. Right. So how does that affect what you do? Yeah, it, well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. Is it seven stages of grief? Uh, that, I don't know what stage we're in, but let's face it. You, you know, I don't make don't mean to make light of it. You know, my business. You know, when we were the only one in town, you know, only game in town, right? Was a pretty comfortable business. Right? Uh, you control the assets. You have exclusive, you know, uh, access and all that. Uh, so in some ways it's been, oh geez, what are we going to do with all this? Here's my answer to that. Uh, partner with it. Leverage it. You, you said catching up. I would offer they're ahead. The, the commercial application of the kind of techniques I just described, there will be more advances on the outside of my agency than in. And that's probably been true for some time. We're just better, again, at whatever stage we're at, accepting it. One, well, we got to acknowledge it, right? It's there. Two, we got to accept it. Three, now we got to embrace it. So, again, part of the reason I'm here today is to let you, others, know we're open for new partnerships. So, don't fight it, partner with it. One of the most interesting things that I've noticed is, and I wonder if you talk a little bit about the advantages. You've hired somebody from DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. And what does that bring to the party? <laughs> uh, uh, is Pixar next? Uh, if, sure, <laughs> sure. Look, um, thank you for mentioning you know our one win, uh, you know, in that business. Because look, I'm sure I've had teammates that I've grown and trained that now work out in Silicon Valley, et cetera, uh, because you know. Uber needs geospatial information, right? And Apple Maps need geospatial information, Google, et cetera. Uh, Planet, uh, the company I just showed you. Um, the government will never compete, right, fiscally right. for those for that talent. And uh, it is what it is. And I don't expect that to change dramatically here uh, with the new administration. I think we've kind of got what we've got. Here's where I, what I can offer. Um, I'll steal from Director Clapper. Uh, he calls it psychic income. I got mission. Um, I can give you the opportunity to make a difference in the employment of medical officers in Liberia or the deployment of, of first responders in South Carolina. Again, with a proper use statement from FEMA telling me to do it. Um, or providing an understanding of the ISIL occupation of Mosul in a way that enables our Iraqi allies to liberate the town. Tough to put a number on that. Now, like you said, we win some and we lose some. To your specific question, the reason why we're interested in getting a DreamWorks skilled professional on our team is the third C that you, that you if you can't convey the information, in a way that's meaningful to the person that needs to use it, it fails. Uh, we fail. So that person is on my visualization team to help me find new and innovative ways to transfer what we think is valuable content in a way that you agree is useful in your decision-making process. Uh, the other striking example 
uh, surprising to me uh, is that at one point, I don't know if it's still true, you had a high school student. Legally. <laughs> I didn't even say what, what he was doing. No uh, child uh, labor uh, laws were violated. Um, Okay, so here's the project uh, that I didn't mention today. So we are building for the second edition. In that case, uh, we opened, became one of our interns, um, Python script writer. Please don't ask me <laughs> any more than that. I just know it's kind of the code of the day, uh, I hope. Uh, is that right? Mm -hmm. Python is in, right? Uh, hashtag, how old is that guy, right? Uh, <laughs> um, but anyway, um, he came in and, and literally was writing code the, 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 for us, uh, helping us script some things on an application that we were going to use in the open. So this is going to go on the iPhone for unclassified provision of information. And I remember I was, of course, we used Pathfinder as a place to bring guests to to say, look, we're, we're trying. and Here's how we're adapting. I had never met him before. And he was just sitting across the table as I was, say, I was hosting you there. And uh, that's how I met him, because he was typing very loudly, right, uh, coding very loudly. And I just said, what's, I like hearing people's story. And I said, what's your story? He said, well, I'm a junior. And I was ready for some college, because we do have interns from college. and that's. That's how I met the young man. Yeah, so you asked him, he, he, he was a junior, and you assumed college, and he said no, he high said, school. He said no, Thomas Jefferson High School, right. So. <laughs> but, but, but again, we, uh, it's, it's, it's a good ex small example of, of, of the talent is everywhere. And if I don't avail myself of that, then, it's, and by the way, it's not about NGA success. I, it's a disservice to those that depend upon me. The downside of that, or the downside risk of that, mm -hmm. now I sound like the damn lawyer, uh, <laughs> is insider threat problems. You know, as you expand the workforce, reach sure. out more. Sure. Uh, we've had a lot of that lately. Sure. And so, how do you manage that? We take it seriously. Um, um, I got a question in the open session about a program that we use, uh, that uh, an application that runs on our networks. Um, and it tries to identify sentiment. Now, this is not a perfect science, but uh, there's some correlation between disgruntlement with your job, some, okay, or anger with a lack of a promotion or whatnot that could correlate to doing something inappropriate with the data, whether it's revenge or whatnot. So in order to treat that seriously, we've employed that. Now, the question I got was more of a, wait a minute, how or why are you doing that? And you can't fire somebody just because they got a sentiment score you know, of 6.2 or whatever. And of course we can't. It is just one of many uh, uh, facets of application that we apply to, to combat that. Um, I do agree with the DNI. I will agree with Admiral Rogers. Uh, I will agree with uh, uh, the head of our um, counterintelligence center uh, under the ODNI um, that there is no such thing as perfect security, right? And let's face it, in, in a connected world, uh, in an enabled world, the weakest link often is going to be you or me. And so, so we anyway, we take the question very seriously. We acknowledge that. that it, whether you're 16 or 60, right, we, we have to have procedures in place to do everything we can to enable such detection. Um, the last thing I want to ask you before I open this up is, a, is about, is my favorite acronym you have. And you've, you've been very good about steering we have some clear good of acronyms. Uh, but I'm going to ruin that uh, by asking you about Cyborg. Oh. Are you going to ask me what it stands for? Mm-hmm. That's a test. Um, commercial imagery. <laughs> oh, my aide doesn't even know. <laughs> People can Google and find it quicker than I can get it. I, 
I do know what it is. Yeah. All right. That's I more important than the thank acronym. You. All right, so Cyborg is a new contract vehicle that we've established with the General Services Administration. And what it is, is it's a way in which new companies, such as the one I showed you, or established companies, like a Harris Corporation or a Boeing, can register their services to provide imagery and geospatial intelligence products in a way in which allows me as an agency, but the rest of the government, to go buy a commodity or a service. Um, let's face it, the business that I'm in is commoditizing, right? You just said, yeah. I can go buy an image off the website. You can. Cyborg is a way to enable us to do that in a more efficient way. And uh, I, I'm never going to figure out what that thing stands for, but uh, you're right. That's a deal. Let me, let, let me open this up to questions from the audience. The gentleman here. Hi, Mark Rosenthal with MITRE. Thank you uh, for, for coming and doing this. I, I have a question that's of a different nature. So the subject's been about transparency, but I think what you've done with uh, NGA has been really transformational. And I would be interested if you, would, um, if you could share a few thoughts on how um, you've had an unusual background, particularly in your last assignment for this job, how that may have colored your view mm -hmm. On, on, on how you've um, transformed the agency. And if you could also perhaps share um, some of the things you've done at NGA that have been transformational even to include uh, restructuring the organization to be more transparent. Well, thanks. Um, yeah, so the, the job that I had for Director Clapper, uh, which was the four year, 2010, 2014 before I got here, was predominantly based out of either the West Wing or the executive office building next door. So it was, it was direct uh, experience with what I call the confluence between intelligence and policy, right? <laughs> First person interactive, uh, whether it was customer number one or more often the deputies within the national security staff. And remember, when I went down there, I had 27 years of experience, thought I kind of knew how the business worked and caught, I, you know, I know how this intelligence thing worked. Um, my experience was that with those kind of customers in that kind of dynamic environment, you had about five seconds to get their attention. If you were successful, you had about another five seconds to prove that you were worth getting their attention right because they could do the walk and then and then you had to deliver in their speed of decision making you, you know again i showed you the best worst example 1812 event 1869 graphic you know but i got to tell you 8 a.m event 10 a.m graphic or story is sometimes too late in today's world let's face it you know, that's the other part of the connection of the transparency. I am not the only information source they're getting, right? It's bombarding them. And so what I took back to this position was, boy, a real tangible that, look, we don't have the time we think we have. Now, I need to quickly caveat, especially to my analysts at the desktop back <laughs> at my headquarters, this doesn't mean we're in the news business. It doesn't mean I'm trying to scoop you know, somebody to race something out the door. Yeah, we'll do that in a critical event, you know, a current crisis, et cetera. You want us to be thoughtful and deliberate and, and, and methodological and, and careful with our tradecraft and all that, all the other debates we've been having uh, in the media. But you've got to balance that between the reality that those decisions will get made <laughs> whether you get there or not. And so what I've tried to do at NGA is one challenge, what I thought was maybe a little too much comfort, you know, because some of you have visited us. We have a very nice building. It's quite different by federal standards. And so uh, one of the downsides to having a very nice building is you can get pretty comfortable. 
And so I've tried to disturb that a bit, create a culture that's a little bit more forward-leaning and a little bit more um, accepting of and recognizing of not just the opportunity, but I think of the obligation that we have, that if I'm going to make that, if, if I'm going to earn that five seconds, I'll have the content right behind it. You have five seconds. Well, you want to trade places? Oh, really? That's yeah. a lot? We yeah. have about one, Yeah. if that. Let me come over here. OK, uh, right over here. My name is Walter Jurasek. Thank you very much for the excellent, actually, core lecture. But let me ask you something. How do you respond to critics about the data manipulation? And you just showed a map about the glo globe and the eyes. But NASA will have a different data than you. And how you, com how you compare and how you fight back, this is not manipulation, new data. How I can trust you? Yeah. And the second question will be very quick. Are you totally depend on the technology? Have you ever looked on the conventional data? Let's say that something happened. And you don't have the access to yeah. the satellite and et cetera. Right. And so, how so, can you deal with it? So the, again, the, f the first part is, remember when I was talking about the pedigree and the uh, legitimacy, the, the, um, um, the accuracy of what I'm presenting? I agree that I need to be able to defend that, right, to, to, to address your question your challenge, right? How do I know that's real? Um, having said that, I also am cognizant that there's a limit, okay, between you and I, because we don't know each other, right? And because I'll have to, over time, develop your confidence that, that what I'm presenting is, is accurate and valid and it's got a, a good pedigree. I get it that when I go in the open, we're, we're, we're establishing new relationships all over. And so I guess my only defense there uh, is consistency, uh, reliability. Uh, I, I completely agree that I would need to earn that trust. Um, but I also, like I said, I'm, I'm aware that there'd be limits to that. that I could, I could find some days when we'll just agree to disagree. Uh, I didn't talk much about the other sources that you, you mentioned. Yes, fully acknowledge that the transparency that I speak of isn't just from space, right? It's all around us, right? The, the world is sensing itself <laughs> uh, in many, many ways. Uh, part of the story, as we understand it, of the Malaysian, the downing of the Malaysian airliner was through those sources as well. Now, you get now get into a secondary question back to your first. How do we know that what's posted, right, or provided also has a pedigree? And, and we, if, if we're going to use that, we owe you that caveat as well, right? Because now you have a second layer where I don't have original ownership. It's derived. So you're accurately describing that this is messy, right? And, and I guess my only commitment to you, to the room, is that I will be as transparent as possible, not to eliminate, but at least to mitigate the questions that would be in your head. Hi, I'm Josh Pollack from the Center on Non-Proliferation Studies. How do you address uh, internal cultural issues mm -hmm. and the, the acceptance of, of uh, greater transparency and a willingness to work with outside partners? Yeah, thank you, because you're letting me get into the second question that I dodged a little bit uh, over here. Um, not because I don't like talking about it. Look, it's front and center. Uh, I tell people often, the movement of our profession to where I believe it needs to go is not a technical challenge. Yes, it is in some ways, but quite frankly, the, the commercial market's going to figure that out if we just find a way to say thank you right, uh, to that. It, it, it's the one you describe. 
So I spent a lot of time um, engaged on this part of the challenge. Um, part of my motivation to standing up Pathfinder, even though it was only 20 people, right, and it was only a very small subset, is to do a couple things. One, it's safe. And I don't mean safe as in secure. It's safe as in this agency, our profession, will allow you, will encourage you, will even reward you for taking some risk. Now, calculated risk always has to be part of the, the equation. To try new things, to fail fast, to fail forward, to learn, and, and to move on. I will not kid you about the slope of my success. It's pretty gradual. We, we are not at the tipping point. We have not, we're not, uh, it's a large agency, okay? Uh, there's a lot of people. And, and I actually, the way I phrase it is in some ways we're held captive by our past. It's very successful. So you, you listen to me and you go, well, wait, are you saying what we did last year, 10 years ago was not good? Hmm. Which I'm not saying, right? But you could interpret it as, oh, you're putting at risk that traditional success with this new business. Um, so Pathfinder is one way. Um, we, we have what we call these rapid feedback teams now. We're, what those are, are are now inside our building. And they're non-traditional combinations of data scientists, image scientists, imagery analysts, computer programmers sitting in groups together, not I'm on the eighth floor, you're on the seventh floor, sixth floor, all tackling a problem or an opportunity in an iterative way. So some of it's through organizational redesign, some of it's through training, some of it's through exposure. A lot of it's just through day in and day out encouragement. Um, but again, I, we work on it <laughs> every moment. Matter of fact, this is part of it. Um, this streaming back to my workspace is, is part of that continued uh, attempt to address our culture. I think we had one down here, in front, here. Hi, Phil Stewart from Reuters. Um, one thing I wanted to bring you back to was your comments on the uh, Malaysian uh, airliner. Mm -hmm. You had said maybe if you had to do it over again, you would have done it differently. And I was, I was recently in Ukraine, and, and there's still debate about what uh, exactly happened. Do you think uh, more information should have been released publicly quicker? Do you think that it didn't make a difference? Uh, what would you have done differently? I don't think I would have released anything differently. I don't know. I, what I was reacting to was John's question about, boy, your story got out last, OK? I mean, you didn't say it that way. But you said there were a lot of story, there were a lot of noise in the system immediately. So when I say differently, I think we need to be more prepared for that eventuality. I, I mean, my, my broad-based example is the way that we were able to react to Ebola was pretty slow. Now, we got there, but boy, it took a while. We did better in Nepal, OK, because of the lessons we had learned. That's what I meant to say by differently. Uh, and, and by the way, too, I should be clear. As an intelligence professional, I don't make the decisions about what's used and what's not. I just make the case. We have policymakers, right? People that sit way higher than I do that say, yes, I will take the public diplomacy advantage that that provides me, and, and I'll accept the hit that I'm going to take on my sources and methods. Um, all I do is give them that choice. Yeah. So I thought there was one right behind here. Yes. <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for doing this. Samantha Ellinger with FedScoop. Um, I had a quick question going back to um, the information you provided on the insider threat software. Mm -hmm. um, I was hoping if you could elaborate if um, you guys uh, possibly got the idea for that from other agencies, like if other agencies are using it, and does it only um, does it only work on the employees' home? Com or, I mean, their work computers, or does it also like? work on other software they use? Like, how exactly does it? So I suspect, I don't know, that we, we love best practices. And, and we certainly take advice and counsel from the DNI's Counterintelligence Center. I don't know in this particular case. Um, 
to your second question, this is w only work, way only work, okay, please. And so if you work for me, by the way, you'll sign 26 pages of papers that say that you give away everything when you're at, in the office. So we have all the right legal authority. And by the way, when you log on to your workstation in the morning, the first thing you see is that same disclaimer. Congratulations, you are now online at the NGA system. Everything you do on this system now will be tracked and sorted and stored and, okay, so everyone knows what's happening. This is not a covert action. This is not, um, it, but it's part of the trade you make to work in an intelligence organization, but only at work, only at work. Gentleman here. Commercial satellite imagery. I'm Mark Brender. I'm on the board of the Digital Globe Foundation. Digital Globe owns and operates high-resolution Earth imagery satellites uh, with one-foot ground resolution. They've tracked the development of military facilities in mm -hmm. the South China Sea, mm -hmm. and that imagery is now available to anybody and has been published in the media. Yep. Has this sort of technology in the hands of the media complicated policy makers, or has it uh, been an added benefit to policymakers? It's done both, okay? Um, I think the, the net is, is positive. And by the way, I don't know if I mentioned it out here before we came in here, D uh, Digital Globe, uh, major mission partner of mine. Um, today, I can't do my business uh, without the provision of support from uh, that company, uh, which is just another example of how the industry is, is enabling our, our core value proposition. Um, and yeah, the fact that the, there is an emerging and growing and more and more capable commercial imagery industry is part of the transparency that I discussed. That transparency results in web pages on CSIS, right, on the South China Sea that I presume, I don't know this, but I'm sure it's driven largely by digital globe imagery and others. Um, Look, uh, there are nonprofit organizations that monitor um, hostilities uh, on the Sudanese border, right, in the Darfur region and whatnot, and they'll use commercial imagery to do that. So sure, I will get a policymaker that will throw me a newspaper article and said, well, did that really happen, right? So you get into the, in this case, you do cause me to chase something that maybe I wasn't, or, and in, in this, I think, is more productive. Can you tell me more about this? Or can you, can you give me some context for the story I just read? And how has this evolved over time? Or you know, is there, are there other pieces of information to it? And to me, that's our job. So uh, I think the, the net is up uh, positive. Let me just follow up on Mark's question quickly. Because we, we, again, we, mm -hmm. we, I'm struck by the yep, similarities similar. between what you do and what we do. Yeah. The one question that that imagery can't answer, and we have access to it, uh, is intent. Correct. And uh, that's where the realm of speculation starts. Mm -hmm. People look at imagery mm -hmm. and say the Chinese are doing this at Scarborough Shoal, yeah. and it must be for that purpose. Yeah. As much as I love my discipline, right, geospatial intelligence, intent is, is, is the hardest, right? OK, I see a tank. I see which way it's pointed. Tell me if it's offensively positioned or defensively positioned, right? What's th what are they going to do next, right? We're, um, pretty hard to tell that from a static image, right? So, but we do very little from one static image. You have to put the story together, whether it's using where was it yesterday, where was it last week, and try to figure out, okay, in a temporal frame, how has this changed? That can give you an indication, doesn't prove it's going here next. But what I, and by the way, this is true of the intelligence community. Our job is to anticipate future events that could create opportunities, a diplomatic engagement, a partnership, et cetera, with a foreign country, or could present a threat. You mentioned North Korea. Most of the things in North Korea are in the latter category, right? So as we do the work that we just agreed we wouldn't talk about in great detail here, you can imagine many scenarios that I'll lay out. Mm -hmm. If he decides X, this is what we would expect to see, okay, from a geospatial intelligence point of view. 
Now, Admiral Rogers and the National Security Agency is doing the same thing with me, just from a different point of view. This is what we mm -hmm. would detect, right? Most often, the story okay, can only come together when we can put all those pieces together. So uh, I would be the last person to say, um, you know, geo is the answer, geospatial intelligence. Uh, we, we, we're proud of the frame that we can provide, right? We're, we're good at providing context. Uh, humans like to see pictures, so we're, we're good at that. Uh, maps also are a great frame to understand. Again, go back to the Napoleonic campaign, a great way to understand. But boy, that's just the beginning of adding all sorts of different value to include the non-traditional pieces that you spoke of. Over here. Uh, thanks, Sean Carberry, uh, Federal Computer Week. Um, as people have said, there is no unhackable, fully secure system, right. entity, whatever. Right. NGA is no longer, it is not an isolated entity. As yep. you said, you're in, interfacing more and more with the commercial sector, with other partners. Can you talk about the, the risks and vulnerabilities that's introducing, the measures that you're having to take to vet these partners and ensure that there yep. is as much security as possible as you expand yeah. who you're working with? Yep. Uh, yes, and, and again, my answer, I think, would be similar to any business leader, right? In this case, I'm a, I run a government organization. But I am quite appreciative of the fact that every time I make that hook, right, to company X or source Y, I'm taking a risk. And so uh, I obviously invest within my resources to do everything I can to put up or to practice proper cyber hygiene. Two, uh, I depend upon others, whether it's Federal Bureau of Investigation, the National Security Agency, Homeland Security, or industry, right, to help put up pickets, you know, around what I can physically protect as much as possible, and ways to give me indicators when the risk is either greater than I'm willing to accept, or the defenses fail, right, and we experience a denial or an attack. So it, it's it's close to that category of counter -int geo -int heading that I've been using a couple of times here. Um, I I do appreciate that. Uh, well, one, we have to get better at it. Two, whenever we think we're good enough, we should be quite nervous about it. Um, uh, I don't know if Admiral Rogers was the first to say this, but uh, I've heard him say before, if man made it, man can break it. So I take no comfort, well, no unnecessary comfort, and when somebody says, oh, that's secure at this level or that's encrypted, I assume we're going to have to constantly be vigilant, whether it's inside, but also those on the outside. Was there one other over here? I, I thought there was. Thank you. And good afternoon, Director. Uh, my name is Todd Wiggins. I am a uh, citizen here at District, of course. Mm -hmm. And so I have uh, two questions, one of which is more on the lighter side. Okay. So we, I'm sure you can delve over to the lighter. My first question is, um, what's your favorite sci-fi movie? <laughs> uh, I go back to uh, Enemy of the State, <laughs> and then more recently, uh, Eye in the Sky, which you may be familiar with. Helen Mirren is one of the stars in that. But um, if I could pick your brain as to what you suggest I should see right now that uh, somehow reflects what you do. And secondly, coming from that, have you ever seen received a congratulatory note from some Hollywood director or a thank you because of what you do hopefully helps make for more entertaining and more educational television? <laughs> I'm trying to think. How disappointed I am that I've not received such a note at this point. <laughs> Maybe this will turn things around for me. Um, first, can I come back to you and say, you know, uh, by the way, hashtag the pocket squares back. So nicely done, right? right. Let's go. We got it. We got to. We got to stick together here, right? See, and, and by the way, the reason I think the pocket square is going to stay is because of the way you're dressed. You have a suit on, right? But not a dress shirt and not a tie. 
So you can do this, and you can throw the color here. I know you really wanted to talk about this. <laughs> um, and yet, pull it off, right? So well done, Todd. And it is Friday. Um, favorite sci-fi film. I'm going to disappoint you. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's probably more into the Star Wars, you know, genre. Now, look, what, what year did Enemy of the State come out? Mid-98, right? So I remember going to that movie. Um, I was 15 years into the business, and I got a little angry because I watched the movie, and I went, well, clearly they're not showing me all the stuff we have, <laughs> right? <laughs> Uh, how is he doing that, and, and why can't I get access to this? And so, I, what I just told you is that was pretty fan. Uh, that was a nice fantasy at the time. Um, having said that, um, look, there's, you know, some, you know, we mentioned DreamWorks earlier. Um, um, I do think that there's overlap here, you know, for completely different reasons, but. Um, Look, uh, uh, you know, the, we used to think that we had a lot of data because we were images. And, you know, everyone who experiences your phones out of storage or whatnot, it's usually those darn images, right? Trust me, um, the world, whether it's a streaming company like Netflix, right, or, a, or an image-based uh, or a map-based company like Uber is figuring out how to deal with that big data. So... To me, the, I actually think it's quite healthy, the prompts that we get from such films, because it, one, it creates interest. I suspect I've got some teammates that joined the agency because they went, wow, that looked really cool. I want to go do that. Of course, they came in the door. We immediately disappointed them. <laughs> um, but they stuck around for the mission. Um, so, um, but yeah, but anyway, nice pocket square. There is no way that I can top that segue. <laughs> so thank you very much. Well, thank you much, very Robert. much, Robert. Yeah, thank it. you all.